Well, there were uh, two hunters out in the woods going on a hunting trip, hunting for deer. And they're walking along, and all of a sudden, one of the hunters collapses. And the other hunter looks at him in, in panic because the other hunter that collapsed, his eyes were fixed, he's not breathing, he can't find a pulse. And the hunter who's, you know, seeing his friend on the ground scared to death is like, oh my gosh, what do I do? He's panicking, so he calls 911. And he's like, oh my gosh, my friend, he just, he, just, uh, he just fell on the ground and gasped and his eyes are set. He doesn't look like he's breathing. I don't see a heartbeat. What do I do? And the, the 911 operator is like, calm down, calm down. I can help you. I can help you. The first thing we need to do is to make sure he's, he's dead. There's a moment of silence. Suddenly, a shot rings out. And the hunter gets back on the phone and says, okay, now what? Oh. Oh. oh boy. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, right? <laughs> anyway, praise the Lord. Some of you will get that later. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Isn't God good? Oh, good. I, I noticed my watch, you know, I'm not used to wearing a suit very often, so I have my watch on, but I noticed the hands aren't moving, so we're in trouble. No, but we've got, we've got a clock back there, so we're okay, all right? All right, amen. Well, let's pray. Father, we love you today. We thank you for the resurrected Savior that we serve. We thank you that Jesus is alive, is alive, and we thank you for this healing that you've already manifested, proving that you've risen from the dead to all of us. We praise you, Lord. We thank you for your word today that brings life and peace to us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you want to turn to an opening text, turn to Romans chapter 1. Roman, the epistle of Paul the Apostle, to the Romans. And we're going to read in verse 16 and 17. Verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Glory to God. I'm telling you, church, I love this verse of Scripture. And I want to tell you, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Are you ashamed of the gospel of Christ? No. no. Why? It is the good news. It's the best news on all of planet Earth, in all the history of mankind. The greatest news that's ever come is that Jesus Christ, God incarnate, came to Earth, left heaven, showed us how to live, showed us the Father. Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father lived and died, died for us on a cross, carried our sins, was die, died, was buried, and on the third day rose again. Amen? This is the gospel of Christ. Now the word gospel is a Greek word and it means something that's so good, it seems like it's so good, it's too good to be true, but it actually is still true. Isn't that awesome? There's not too many things... You know, there's the old saying that says it's too good to be true. Where the gospel is too good, but it's still true. It's the most true, real thing there is in this life, is to know Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And the Bible says in Romans 1 that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation. Amen. The power of God. That word power is the Greek word dunamis. And it means the mighty, powerful ability of God. The mighty, powerful ability of God. Isn't that awesome, church? God says in the gospel, the mighty, powerful ability of God was released on your behalf and on my behalf. Isn't that awesome? And it says it's released unto an effect. In other words, this power of God that was released has an effect, and that effect is salvation. Can you say salvation? salvation. Now, when I say the word salvation, many are going to think that the word salvation means 
just to be saved. And, and thank God it does mean to be saved. That's good news, isn't it? But it actually means a whole lot more than that. The word, Greek word uh, salvation means soteria. Soteria, that's the word. It means to rescue and save. To bring to health. To deliver or set free. To bring to safety. You see, salvation manifested a moment ago when Aiden's back went from pain level 6 to pain level 0. That's part of the gospel of the kingdom of God that Jesus is present and He will heal your body. Did you see all these things that are here that happen as a result of the gospel? It's not just that your sins are forgiven, but so many blessings. A.B. Simpson says this. He says, uh, the gospel tells rebellious men that God is reconciled, that justice is satisfied, that sin has been atoned for, that judgment of the guilty may be revoked, the condemnation of the sinner canceled, the curse of the law blotted out, the gates of hell closed, the portals of heaven open wide, the power of sin subdued, the guilty conscious healed, the broken heart comforted, the sorrow and misery of the fall undone. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, this is the best news there's ever been. Amen? I want to share with you a few things because this is an exhaustive list. but It's not an exhaustive list, but I want to share a few things that because of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ have been made available to you. Say, available to me. This is being offered by God to each one of us. Some of you have already received this. Others may not have, but you're going to have a chance. Amen? You're going to have your chance. Glory to God. So the first thing is forgiveness of sins and righteousness. For God doesn't just forgive your sins, but He makes you righteous. Amen? In the Old Testament, they were covered. They were covered temporarily, and their sin was hidden. That's not what happens in the New Covenant. In the New Covenant, you are actually born again, and you become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, according to 2 Corinthians 5.21. Isn't that awesome? The second thing that happens is you get a new birth or a new, birth, or a new start. Can you say a new birth? new birth? So God doesn't fix up the old person You used to be. When you make Christ your Lord, what happens is the Bible says, if, that's the, that's the, that's the contingency. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. A, one translation that for that word creature is a new species of being, one that never existed before. Hallelujah. Nobody's ever seen until Jesus died and rose again, the new creature that you can become. And if you're in Christ, you're not what you used to be. You're a new creation. You're a new species of being, one that never existed before. You're not just a human, but you're a son and a daughter of the Most High God, made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm telling you, you're supernatural royalty. Say, I'm supernatural royalty. (laughs) <laughs> glory, that's the truth. That's, that's the real truth of the matter. When you become a new creation, you become a son and daughter of the Most High God. Not an earthly monarchy, a son and daughter of God Most High, El Elyon, the Most High God, Jehovah. Amen? Glory to God. I don't know if that didn't excite you. I don't know what to do with you, right? Number three, you get peace with God. Peace with God. How many people are going through life with that sense of sin, guilt, and condemnation, knowing that they are doing things violating their conscience and knowing there's no remedy for their sins because they haven't made Jesus the Lord of their life and they're living under that that dread and, and they live in expectation of something bad or worse coming. I'm telling you as a believer, you've been made the righteousness of God. I'm not expecting bad. I'm expecting better and better and better and better. Why? Because I've been made righteous. I've been qualified by His blood for all of His goodness and all of His blessings and I had nothing to, go- to do with it. I couldn't have earned it if I tried. He said, I'm going to give it to you by faith. We're in a faith system. Amen? 
I read in Romans 1, it's from faith to faith. The, the righteousness of, of God is revealed from faith to faith. Amen? And the just shall live by what, church? We live by faith. We walk by faith. Glory to God. Which means we trust what God says. We believe what God says. We even believe what God says above temporary, transient circumstances that are subject to change. If sickness tries to hit my body, I don't deny that the sickness is, 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 is present. I deny its right to stay because it doesn't belong to me. Amen? Amen? Glory to God. So we have peace with God. Isn't that good news? The Bible says being justified by faith, we have peace with God. God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, what a deal. What, a, what an awesome blessing. Amen. Peace with God. Justified. When I was a baby Christian and I had just gotten born again, I remember a pastor said to me, I was thinking about what does justified mean? Reading my Bible. And I heard him get up and preach and he said, if you look up justified, what it means is just as if I'd never sinned. Justified. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isn't that awesome? Just as if we never sin. And the next thing we get, number four, is eternal life. Now, eternal life is not a duration. It has nothing to do with how long you're going to live. Every human who has ever been born on planet Earth is an eternal being and will live forever. It's not duration. It's quality. It's experiencing the God kind of life here and now and forever. What, what do you mean the God kind of life? I mean that you can have power. Power over sickness and disease. Power over sin. Power over fear. Power to preach the gospel. Power to walk in love. Supernatural grace and power. And his yoke is easy and his burden is light. So I don't have to go through life stressed and figure out how it's going to work out. I know my God has already been to tomorrow and He's already made a way for me. There's nothing I have to fear. There's nothing I have to worry about. I'm moving in the unforced rhythms of grace. That's what one translation says about Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30, is that believers, we can move in the unforced rhythms rhythms of grace. What's that mean? There's a grace of God that comes upon you, comes upon me, and empowers us to be successful and blessed in everything we do. Amen? We're not living by our intellect. We're not living by our physical strength. We're not trying to make our own way. We're saying, Father, what do you have for me? Because what he has for me, there's a grace there's an anointing. There's a divine empowerment to walk it out supernaturally. Look, some people think, uh, you know, healing the sick is impossible. I'm telling you, living the Christian life is impossible. It's totally impossible. You can't even begin to do it, neither can I. And I know that. I proved it. <laughs> so here's the thing. How do we do it? By putting Christ on. Putting Him on. And in Him, I live and move and have my existence, my being. And when I do that, guess what? It's His grace moving through me that empowers me for life. And it's His love, not my love. My love falls short. It comes to an end. His love is infinite. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Eternal life. It's living the God kind of life now. Number five. You might need a verse for that. Okay, I'll give you a verse. 1 John 5, 12. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And that's not life like a heartbeat. That's the Greek word zoe. It means life as God lives it. Isn't that awesome? You know, my kids get to live life as I live it because they're part of my house. So they get what I got. Amen? Amen. If you're part of God's house, you get what he's got. You get it? The God kind of life. Number five is restored dominion. Restored dominion. Amen? What does this mean? It means, for if by one man's offense, death reigned by one. What's that talking about? It's Adam. He sinned in the garden, right? His sin passed sin to all mankind, right? If by one man's offense, death reigned, spiritual death, which is separation 
from God because of our sins, right? Much more. Somebody say much more. Much more. Were those who re, uh, receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. Do you hear it's a gift? Reign in life by the one man, Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome? You've been, you've been restored to reigning. You're either a victor or a victim. I cannot be a victim. It is impossible for me to be a victim. Well, so, yeah, that doesn't mean that in this life somebody can't do something really heinous to you. If you live very long on this earth, somebody's going to do something probably really heinous to you, and you'll get a chance to forgive them, right? Because how many of you know we may be saved, but we come in contact with unsaved people quite often, and we're called to, to, to lead them to Jesus, right? But I'm not a victim. I can't be a victim. I'm a victor. In, G- in Jesus. He won the victory and he gave the victory to me. So I'm not mad at nobody. I'm not, I'm not upset with no, anybody out there because no man can stand before me all the days of my life. No man can stand before you all the days of your life. If you're a believer, you are a victor. Amen? <laughs> you're a victor. The victory has been restored. The victory over sin, death, the grave. Amen? The other thing that's been restored because you've been made right with God, you have restored fellowship. Amen? What is fellowship? It's two fellows in the same ship. No. (laughs) Fellowship is koinonia, communion, intimacy, right? In the book of 1 John chapter 1, verse 3, it says, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that you may also have fellowship with us. And then he says this, the Apostle John says this, Truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome? That this God who spoke the universe into existence wants to have a relationship with you and with me, and He longs to have fellowship with us. That's what prayer is. It's talking to God. It's having fellowship with God. Isn't that amazing, church? Don't we have an awesome God that we have? Amen? Amen. You know, the next thing that we get because of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus is freedom from fear. Freedom from fear. The Bible says that all our life, because we weren't right with God, well, I'll just read it, Hebrews 2.14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also, Jesus, himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. You know, you probably recently heard somebody say, that scared me to death. You ever heard somebody say that? That's a true statement. You want to know why that's a true statement? It's not that they were scared to death, it's that they are scared of death. And they're scared of death because they're not born again. Or they're ignorant, <laughs> right? You understand what I'm saying? It, like one time when I was a kid, I was on a highway. Don't do this, kids. And uh, I was in a car, and I was going way too fast, triple digits. And this car pulled out in front of me. And when this car pulled out in front of me very close, I slammed on the brakes, and my car went sideways into the oncoming lane. And there was another car coming in, in the other lane. So I looked down at my Speedo as I'm going sideways down the two-lane highway, and this car's coming in my oncoming lane, and it's going to hit the driver's door, and my mind went, I looked at the speedo, and it said 90 miles an hour. 90 and 60 is 150. I just hit the wall. I just hit a brick wall at 150 miles an hour. I'm dead. Oh, and by the way, I just killed my two friends in the car. And terror went through me, stark terror. But God sent his angel. And a second before that car hit my door and killed me instantly, my car was thrown into the other lane. That car went by. I was about to hit the car in front of me, and somehow I whipped around that car as another car was coming and barely missed a head-on collision with it. And I pulled off the highway on the side just shaking and trembling, terrified. Why was I terrified? Because I wasn't saved. And had I hit that car, I would have been in hell instantly. Because I didn't know God, and I wasn't serving God. Amen? But God sent his angel. 
Some of you can look back at your life when you weren't walking with God and God sent His angel and protected you even though you did something stupid like I did. Thank God, hallelujah, that He sends His angels. The Bible says that they're not all ministering spirits sent to minister for those who shall be heirs of salvation. Oh, I'm so glad about that four because he knew one day, February 9th, 1992, I'd confess Jesus as my Lord and begin my walk with him. But it was before that 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 happened. But I was terrified of death. So terrified I had to pull over and I was shaking. Why? Because something in me knew I wasn't ready to die. That it wasn't safe to die without knowing Christ. That's the truth. The gospel of Jesus Christ gives us a glorious future, church. It gives us a glorious future. I don't care how bad life is right now. I don't care what you're going through. I care, but what I'm saying is it is irrelevant in the light of eternity. Because in the light of eternity, this life is a vapor. When you sprayed your hair this morning, or your wife did, right? And you saw the hairspray for a second. It's just, it's a vapor. It's there for a second, and then you can't see it, right? In the light of eternity, whatever we go through is just a microsecond. We're going to live forever. And God said the glorious life we're going to have in this next life is beyond anything. We can't, the Bible says, eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, neither has it entered into the heart of men. The things which God has prepared for those who love him. We get little glimpses and little tastes, just little teeny tiny specks and crumbs. And we're like, wow, you ain't seen nothing yet, baby. You don't want to miss this eternal party. (laughs) You don't want to miss this party, amen? We have a glorious future. I'm going to live forever. You're going to live forever. Hallelujah. There's a peace that comes about you when you no longer fear death. Christians that are being martyred, they smile at death. They sing songs of praise. Because they're about to be physically in the presence of their Lord. That's a different look at death. That's not fear of death. Isn't God good? Somebody give him some praise. (laughs) Timothy Keller says this. If Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about anything he said? The issue on which everything hinges is not whether or not you like his teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. You see, he can't be a a good teacher. He can't be a prophet. He said, I'm the son of God. he, He either is the son of God or he's a lunatic. You either fall at his feet and call him Lord, or you reject him completely. There is no middle ground. He didn't leave any middle ground. Not not, not an inch of middle ground. He said, I am the son of God. I'm the way. I'm the truth and I'm the life. There's nobody, no one shall come to the Father but through me. He is the only way. Now think about this. In the history of the world and in comparing the three major religions... Islam, Hinduism, and Christianity. Only one faith has a leader who died and came back from the grave. All those other guys are dead and rotting. I'm not serving another dead, rotting leader. My leader only needed to be there for three days. And he he rose up from the dead. Amen? Amen? Of all those faiths, only one man claims to be God incarnate. The Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Only one. You know, a lot of these other faiths have wisdom and books and leaders, but none of them can solve the sin problem. Only one of these faiths, Christianity, with Christ its King, says that I have borne your sicknesses. I have borne your sins. And if you make me the Lord of your life, all of that is washed away by my blood. And I will save you. There's no other religion that gives you that. 
Why do you think there's suicide bombers with Muslims? That's the only sure way that they can guarantee they'll get it, that they'll get to heaven. Only, that's the only guarantee there is. So they kill a whole bunch of people. Who's the author of death? It's the devil. It's not Jesus. Get a clue, right? Now think about this. Of all those faiths, only one faith has a leader that died for his followers. Muhammad didn't, fought, didn't die for those that follow Islam. Amen? The Hindu gods, they didn't die for their people. My Jesus died for my sins. I was a wretched sinner. And he died for me. Because he loved me. He died for you. Because he loved you. You know, this gospel is not good news if you don't believe that you're sinful. If you think you're just okay, I'm better than the next person. I'm as good as some, worse than others. He can't do anything with you. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. I'm better than this person. I'm a pretty good person. Imagine this. Imagine this. I go to Beverly Hills. And I find the most expensive house there. Let's say it's $150 million. And it's gated and there's security. And I go there and I say, hey, I want to come live with you. I'm a good person. I'm a really good person. What are they going to say? Get lost. We don't know you from Adam. I don't know you. And yet people think I can ignore God my whole life. I can reject the gospel and I can live any way I want, and one day I'm going to stand before God and go, I'm a good person. What did the Bible say he's going to say? Depart. I don't know you. So the question is, is do you know him? He wants you to know him. He loves you. He loves you so much he died for you. That's a lot of love. It's a lot of love. Amen? Hallelujah. Think about this. Peter Kreft said this. Why would the apostles lie? Liars always lie for selfish reasons. If they lied, what was their motive? What did they get out of it? What they got out of it was misunderstanding, rejection, persecution, torture, and martyrdom. Hardly a list of perks. Think about that. Think about this. you got 12 guys who says Jesus rose from the dead and he appeared to us over a 40-day period of time after he died, after he's crucified. He appeared to us over and over and over. You're telling me those 12 guys made that story up, kept the secret for 40 years. You can't, te- you can't keep a secret between two people for 10 minutes hardly. You're telling me 12, 12 men and a whole lot of other people, followers as well, were able to keep a secret that Jesus really didn't rise from the dead in the face of torture and gruesome deaths. I don't believe it. I simply don't have that much faith. You, if you can believe that, you've got way more faith than I have. Amen? No, I, don't, I, I can't believe that. It's just, it's, it takes too much faith. But Jesus came and he said these words. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Amen? You know, we sang something earlier today that God is holy. The Bible says that the angels around His throne, they look upon Him and they cry holy and they fall down. And then they get back up and they look again and they cry holy. And it says they've been doing that since the day they were created. Now, why would they do that? Because every time they see him, they see a new facet of his holiness. He is a holy God. The Bible says he dwells in unapproachable light. And here's something I learned in heaven. I learned when I, when I had a vision of heaven, the night I got saved, I learned that it was unjust for me to exist another second as a sinner, because I'm already guilty. Do you know what's unjust? If somebody's committed a murder, to let them just keep running along doing whatever they want to do? No, they should, what's the, the, what's the right thing? They should be apprehended and punished for their crime immediately, not someday, right? But God in his great mercy and grace has given you this time, has given me this time. Why? 
because he loves us. You know, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Did you know that, church? Now, somebody might say, well, aren't there many ways to God? Let me ask you a question. If I was going to invite you over to my house, I could tell you, okay, you need to go north on western, you need to take east on 15th, and you need to go X, Y, Z, right? That's how you're going to get to my house. But you could say, I believe there's many ways to your house. I don't want to go north on western. I'm going to go south on western, right? What will happen? You're not going to get to my house. What did God do? He try, he's trying to get you to his house. He said, here's the way to get there. There aren't 15 roads. There's one way. Because there's only one spotless lamb of God who took your sins and mine. And he took them willingly. And he bore our sins. And he died on the tree for you and me. And he rose from the dead. He's the only way. There isn't three ways, ten ways, a million ways. His standard of righteousness is beyond what any human can achieve. So God could either be unjust, right? Think about this. If God just said, I'm going to have a relationship with you although you're sinful, he could never punish the devil. It would be unjust to let us go free when we've sinned and let the devil be punished. And he's a terrorist that kills, steals, and destroys, the Bible says, right? So God had to make a way because he loved us so much where our sin and our guilt could be dealt with and satisfy his love. And the Bible says mercy triumphs over justice. So Jesus, when you were standing in the courtroom guilty and the sentence of death was handed down, Jesus stood up and said, I'm going to take your sentence. Sit down and go free. Not only sit down and go free, but here's all my blessings. That's the grace and love of God. Jesus took care of what we could never take care of. If he didn't love us, he could have snapped his fingers and this whole thing would have vaporized in a microsecond and he could start over. But that's not his nature. He's a good, good father. I'm telling you, he loves you so much. The Bible says that it's by faith that we enter a relationship with God. Isn't that wonderful? It's not by what you do, it's by Believing in what Christ did. It's believing that he died for your sins and took the penalty for them. It's believing that he died and was buried and he rose again from the third day. And Jesus says this to his followers, follow me. You can't follow a dead guy. He's not dead. He's living. And I want to invite every person here, if you don't know that you're right with God or you've never publicly made a profession of your faith. What do I mean publicly? The, Jesus called all his disciples publicly. He never uh, took them in a dark room and said, oh, will you follow me? Never did that. It was always a public following of him, confessing him before man. The Bible says, if you will confess me before men, I will confess you before my father. Amen? How many of you want to hear God confess you in heaven? Jesus confess you before the father. They belong to me. They're mine. Oh, hallelujah. That's a good place to be. To know that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. To know that you have eternal life. To know that your sins are forgiven. To know that when this life ends, you will enter glory. Hallelujah. There was a rock band named Van Halen, and they had a song called, I Want the Best of Both Worlds. I'm telling you, the best of this world is knowing Jesus. I was a wicked sinner for 18 years and I tried most all of it, but I was born again. And I'm telling you, I have no regrets. It's beyond language, the regrets I don't have for walking with God versus living for the devil. The devil is an evil, wicked taskmaster that will beat you down your whole life. And there is no spiritual Switzerland. There is no demilitarized zone. If you're not serving Jesus, the devil has dominion over you and he will make your life hell. But when you get born again, guess what? You're going to make his life hell. Because Jesus is literally one day going to throw him in to the lake of fire. And that's who was created for, the devil and his angels. But today, 
If you want to do what I did on February 9th, 1992, if you want to meet this Jesus, have your sins forgiven. Get all these benefits I just told you about. They're free because he paid a great price for them. But they're free to you and me because of what he has done. If you want to do that, the Bible says if. Somebody say if. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You shall be saved. For with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. I would love to introduce you to Jesus today. I want everybody to stand on your feet if you would right now. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Maybe you're here today. And you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. You've never publicly confessed Him as your Lord and Savior. Today is your day. Not tomorrow, not someday. Today, right now is your day. Now is the time. Look, the devil will not tell you this gospel is not true. He knows it's true. What he'll tell you is wait. He'll tell you, just don't respond. Just wait. I want to invite you to rebel against the devil. Kick his teeth in. Say, devil, I'm not going to hell. You're going to hell. I'm going to heaven. I'm getting my sins forgiven. I'm going to have eternal life. I'm going to have restored dominion. I'm going to have peace with God. I'm going to have fellowship with God. I'm going to have joy unspeakable and full of glory. I'm going to have no fear of death because I know when this life is over, it only gets better, not worse. If you're here today, rebel against the devil. And on the count of three, I want you to lift your hand. If you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life, we don't know when this life is over. This may be your last chance. Don't gamble with your eternity. God loves you. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He so loves you. He so loves you. He went to the very length of dying on the cross for you. And today is your day. Today is is the time. On the count of three, if you want to get right with God, you've never made Jesus Lord of your life, or you're away from God. One day you confess Jesus as your Lord, but He's not your Lord today. You're not walking with Him. You're doing your own thing. Sin's gotten its claws into you, and you're, you're sinking and you want to come back to God, today is a day to come back. The Father is calling you back to His house. The Father loves you so much. He loves you so much. If that's you, either one of those things, on the count of three, don't listen to the devil. Don't listen to fear. Listen to your heart. It's telling you, now's the time to come home. Amen? One, two, three. Three, lift your hand up if that's you and you want to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. If you're here and you need to make him the Lord of your life or you're coming back, I see that hand. 